performer, as most of you got the great opportunity to see that yesterday. He's a youth advocate and a motivator. Early, an, after an early history of social and academic challenges, including learning disabilities, preteen arrest, and expulsion from an alternative school and from college, Hassan found the courage to change. <clears throat> he then went on to graduate from college and from law school, and Hassan applies his intimate knowledge by advocating for justice, education, diversity initiatives on a local, state, and national levels where he continues to encourage building, living, and learning communities where all people have the opportunity to exceed. It is my great pleasure to introduce Hassan Davis. Remember that song about Bill Withers? They know me. No, it goes. Sometimes in our lives, tell me out. We all have pain. We all have sorrow. But what is real life? We know that. That was the song on the radio the day I got news about my cousin. See, I was at home by myself and had the radio turned up kind of loud, and I guess I was trying to sing, too. And the phone rang. Hello, I said. And nobody answered. Hello, I said a bit louder, and his voice started screaming, he's dead. They killed Bebe. And the whole world starts spinning, me trying to sit before I fall with this voice echoing through my soul. They killed Bebe, and Bill was on the radio singing, call me when you need a friend. You see, Bebe was my cousin, Cedric, about the same age as my youngest brother, Tony, and he was dead. The first of my generation to go out like that. And he wasn't the last, he wasn't the youngest, he just got to be the first. Bebe was the father at 16, he used to run the street, but we all ran the street. He knew how to laugh at himself. You got to know how to laugh at yourself if you're going to survive those St. Louis streets. So I go home to the funeral. The boy who killed my cousin is already out of jail. And that's when me and mine start talking like it's time to go play, you know. Time to go play judge and go play jury. It's time to go play executioner. And that's when it hits me. This is what it's all about. Letting your emotion drive you to the edge of sanity, holding on so tight and so long to the madness that it eats you up from the inside and it builds and it builds and then blam! You can't help but go off like a gun. Somewhere, another child sits watching the door that won't ever open again. And somewhere, another mama sits staring at a phone she knows won't ring. Somewhere a whole family has changed again, forever. And that is not how I want to make it to the other side. So I start trying real hard not to let other people push my buttons and make me do things. And sometimes I still get so damn mad I can't see straight. And then that song will pop into the back of my head. And sometimes I pick up the phone and I push the little star button and I say, hello, you know, I'm talking to the other side. I say, I miss you, baby. I say, I miss you, Stevie. God, I miss JoJo. See, JoJo was only 14 when they shot him in the head. I say, um, I miss you, and I will never forget you, and, and thanks for listening, and I, I wish, I wish, I wish I could return to faith. But I'll talk to you again real soon. Just, just keep watching my back. Peace. And the whole time, it's that song. It never stops playing in the back of my head. I ride up the road and I'll share your load if you just call me. Call me. Now I remember that song now. Because now that's Bebe's song. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Hassan Davis, and, and I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here. I'm excited to be here. I was excited to be with you yesterday. And if you don't mind, I'm going to take my jacket off. 
if my mama asks color, I did have it on. But it's, it's, it's driving me crazy, and, and i got to move around a little bit. First thing I want to let you know before I get started is, is that I'm ADHD and dyslexic. i got some other diagnoses y'all will probably figure out before we're done here. And, and, and I know y'all probably know because we deal with this all the time, but I was, I was speaking at a behavior health and mental health conference up in Pittsburgh a couple years ago. and had like 700 providers and consumers in this whole room, and you know, it was great. And I was going through my thing, and there was people down the front row writing notes, and I was like, yes, this is so great. I get to them, and right as I finished, they kind of rushed the stage like a concert. And people started handing me prescriptions and diagnoses <laughs> and, and, re and referrals. And so I realized that people spend a whole lot of time, especially people who kind of know, going, oh, Lord. <laughs> this child is lost, and he don't even know he lost, right? And so what I do now, let's just tell folks, it's OK. I know, and I'm OK. You need to be OK, because in order for the children and families we serve to really get to be successful, we have to let them know that this is not something we isolate and separate from, but we own and we command and we decide how it works for us. And that's the hard piece of all of this stuff that we do. So my name is Hassan Davis, and I'm excited to be here because, uh, because I like karaoke, and it was a great thing. I mean, we just kind of got into it, and so tonight it might be on, right, y'all? Look for the karaoke sign. I currently serve as Commissioner of Juvenile Justice for the State of Kentucky. Operational, administrative, and fiscal responsibility for more than 30 facilities ranging from group homes to, to, to level 5 detention. And all the services in between from pre-adjudication to post-adjudication and aftercare back to the community. About 1,350 employees and hoping to get that transition where we stop locking kids up for their best interest and start sending folks to the community, to the families. A great conversation we had last night with me and Barb and Joyce talking about this model that has been part of, of this community for so long, where if we don't want to lock kids up, we don't want to separate them from families, we don't want to create this incredible rift that destroys communities, and we have to actually insert people into those communities to work and to champion and to support them successful right there. And that's the model that I'm trying to build. And it makes people nervous when we start talking about corrections with a justice lens. And, you know, I keep saying, what well, we call it juvenile justice, you should at least, like, Pretend that's important, right? I mean, it just makes sense to me. And so I'm excited about that. I've, I've served as three years as vice chair of the Federal Advisory Commission on Juvenile Justice out of D.C. for the Office of Justice. I served as chair of the State Advisory Group on Juvenile Justice in Kentucky for 10 years as the three governors. So, you know, that's kind of the work that I've been in uh, for most of my adult life, working with, with young people, trying to create the opportunity to access the world the way they need to access it, not the way I think they ought to access it. And there's a real difference. And so, before all that, though, I think it's important to understand where stories start. I grew up like lots of kids. We know. Potential and possibility. Everybody looked at me and talked about the great things that could happen. Oh, gosh, he's going to be a, a, a chef. Look at the way he's wearing that. He's going to be a designer. Oh, look at the way that handwriting. He's going to be a doctor. You know, all those things that come up. And, um, and I had this great opportunity. I had this family. And just me and my sister when I was very young. My older sister and my dad and mom were there. And it was just a complete family unit. Everybody seemed to be in jail. You know, that picture of me in my father's arms my fourth birthday. And that's my blue jet airplane. And um, it's one of the last clear, crisp memories I had of us as a family. And it's one of those things that kind of, it's interesting because things can fall apart. Uh, but as I grew older, people started telling me that I need to be more realistic. That uh, you ain't going to be to be all that. And, you know, we might have a little more problem than we thought. And, you know, maybe we need to call some people. And eventually I wound up with this laundry list. The black male child from the inner city with ADHD and dyslexia and severe visual impairment. I was deaf in one ear and they had to put tubes in multiple times to finally clear the passage enough and I still got issues with it. I was borderline this and that and struggling. When I was six years old, my sister and I walked in on my dad, straddled my mom on the couch, both hands around her neck, choking the life out of her. My sister ran to the kitchen and grabbed the butcher knife, and I ran and grabbed a, a Coke bottle and stood there as menacing as a six and seven year old can with a grown man who hands around your whole life. And when he looked over and saw us, I'm sure it was not fear, but maybe he saw something reflecting in our eyes that made him just for a second hesitate in his action. And in that moment, my mother dove grasping for the phone and called the police. As they arrived and escorted my father away in handcuffs, everything changed again. Soon they were separated, then they divorced, and things fell apart. 
we went on and off the welfare roads. My mom said, it wasn't on welfare, we just got food stamps, you know. It wasn't like we got the black label peanut butter like my cousins, right, or the, the powdered eggs. Y'all know what I'm talking about, old school, right? Uh, but we had food stamps, and we went, moved around from house to house, aunt to cousin to, to parents, trying to figure out how to get stable again. Like a lot of the families you serve, I imagine, you know this story. We used to get those old school food stamps, though. We didn't get, like, the cool credit card you got nowadays. You go to Walmart and be like, dee, dee, you know, put your pen in, and it's like American Express. We got the book in the mail every month, right? And with the brown $1 bill food stamp and the green $5 bill and the purple $10 bill. So everybody knew that you were that child when you went to the store because you were buying food for the coloring book. The sixth grade is also when they started locking me in the code room at school. Because I was one of those kids that wasn't worth the time and the effort because I was already broke, you know, returned to sender. And so and in order to keep me from those kids who might have potential but for my influence, they put me in the coat room. I sat in that coat room for several days trying to figure out what I do with it because I'm an engaged learner. I'm one of those folks who actually reaches my capacity along with high-functioning Folks. And so when you put me in the group with the high-functioning readers, I could, you know, I was just faking it, but I could get everything they got. And so there was a lot of communication, a lot of talking, a lot of, what did you think about that, Susie? But I could get it. If they put me in this box, mom always told me, you find yourself in a place, two things you have to do, figure out why you were there and what you do to make that experience yours, to own it, to make it useful. Well, I knew I was there because I was that kid, right? Trying to get isolated and moved away from everybody else. I've been put in special ed and been moved from box to box most of my life. But what do you do with this experience? I sat in that room for about three days, shut down, and I looked up one day and realized that the code room is also where everybody keeps their lunchbox. <laughs> and all of a sudden, this got to be prime real estate because when I was a kid, we didn't. But get into one thing, you're good. Mama, give me six dollar bill, food stamp, go to the corner store, about five silver cents. Back in the day, about five pieces of candy for five cents, because they called it penny candy for a reason, right? Remember that? And so about five pieces of penny candy, and at the corner store, unlike the national chains, they national chains had those food stamp coins. And so they would give you those back, but the corner store didn't. And so you give them a dollar bill food stamp, they would have to give you 95 cents hard cold cash back, and you could go to school jingling. You could buy milk and milk break by lunch at lunchtime, and for a few days you could pretend you were just like the other kids. At the end of the month, not always so. At the end of the month, we got what we needed, mostly. But in this cold room, I figured out why I was here. To make sure that I got what I needed completely. And so a few days, I ate good. Because Susie had a peanut butter jelly sandwich without the crust. Bobby always had fruit cups, and Jimmy always had tang. Instant <laughs> breakfast drink. Y'all the tang, right? So things were really good until parents started coming concerned about their children coming home from school hungry, and they had to come investigate the, the mystery of the cold room, and they came in there, and there I was with seven or eight lunchboxes spread around me like a buffet. And, um, and they had to put me back in the classroom to keep an eye on that bad boy that eats everybody's food what they accidentally did, and no choice of their own to put me back in the zone. They created a way. Sometimes that's all you need is an open. Sometimes that's all we need is a, a clear shot at the, at the sunlight. That's the commission said. And then we have to run with it. And so life for me, as you can tell, was always a challenge. In third grade, we finished up third grade, and we moved from St. Louis to Atlanta, Georgia. I wound up in my fifth education placement in Atlanta, or fourth, fifth, and sixth, before I got to seventh grade. I got my first arrest when I was 11 years old. At the police department, there was this long, drawn-out drama that mostly centered around race and class, and a lot of other stuff that I want to get into, but you all probably can figure it out. At the end of the day, we wound up in a, in a conflict, but as mothers came, they were all angry and frustrated, and I think you probably need to know this too, because the same thing with kids at school, when parents come trying to support kids, and they don't know how, and they come up, and they're embarrassed, and they're frustrated, and they're afraid, and they're nervous for these children that they love so much and want to be successful, but don't know how to access that power, but it all comes out as anger, right? 
screaming at the faculty, screaming at the teacher, screaming at the child. And so as the mothers came to the police station, they were all kind of hyped up. You know, I had to take three buses to get here. I might lose my job. I got three more kids at home. I'm going to take you away next time. I'm going to let you stay with your daddy. All that stuff was coming out. So by the time my mom showed up, I had this great speech I'd been preparing. You know, you don't understand what I got to do to survive in the world because I'm a black man. You just back up off me, man, because I'm going to do what I got to do. I'm paraphrasing. That was kind of what I was going to go with, right? And, um, and so I've been hyping myself up, waiting for this conflict all day. And she finally came in and uh, did the paperwork. And she was very calm. And she thanked the police officers, which just made me more nervous, right? And, uh, but I was like, OK, so she's not going off because we're in the police station. Duh, right? You know, you go off to the police station, they lock you up. So when we get outside, it's on. We got outside, and I did that thing where you kind of walk close, but not close enough, just in case, you know, you know. And I'm waiting for it to start, and, and she's still very calm and just walking. And I'm like, well, you know, we are still in the parking lot, so somebody could call child family service. So you know, when we get in the car, though, with those windows up, <laughs> she's gonna lose her mind. And so I got in the car, and I, I sat right at the door with no seatbelt on. We didn't have to wear seatbelts back then, right? And, and I was like, had my hand on the handle just in case I had to bail out. But, you know, you, you build up this expectation, right? And so I'm sitting there waiting to justify myself and deal with whatever's coming. And, and about halfway home, I'm about to pass out from all this expectation I got, <laughs> just waiting for my moment to be right. And so I finally get the courage to look up at her. And she's just crying. She's huge. And finally she comes down to me and she says, baby, if you could see what I see every time I look at you, you would know how great you already are. I didn't know what to do with that. I, mean, I kind of sat there looking stupid for a little while and, you know, and I kept thinking, this lady crazy? She had seen it. Because the whole world out there only sees this stuff on the board. She's looking at me, telling me that I, I'm already great. I just need to be able to see it. And so it, it confused me and left a little bookmark in my head trying to figure out I need to get back to that. But I still had life to live and I still had struggles to go through. And so I continued down my path. When I was 12, our apartment burned down. We lost everything that we had. It was the first Christmas that we had where we weren't going down to the Hosea Williams Christmas for every poor child in Atlanta where they would bring thousands of poor kids to the Civic Center and they would give you a chance to line up and sit on Santa's lap and take that one Polaroid you could take home and they would give you a gift. It says, boy, age five to seven. Gift girl, age 7 to 12, and you had a big plate meal. This is the first Christmas where my mom and dad both had work, and they're both actors and artists, and so they were engaged in the community. But we had gifts. We had Shogun Warriors and robots and, and cool stuff. And it all burned down because three doors down, there was a, a man who worked the third shift, and his wife got up to, to make him breakfast. Before he went off and the baby started crying and she left the bacon on the stove and, and the grease caught fire and it hit that stove and it hit the shelves and since there's no firewall between these substandard houses in section eight, everything went. And we stood there and watched it burn and we lost everything again. My mother separated us out and got us all back together, but she didn't want me to, to go to my sixth elementary school, so she kept me in the school so the movie moved the family moved back into the city. So I began this journey of a two hours ride out to school every morning, two hours ride back. And the interesting thing about that ride, I, and it just hit me, and I apologize for the ADHD it does for you. So um, I got like 75 slides on here, but I'm pretty sure I'm not going to be able to get to. But, 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 at, but at the, the reason for it is because I, there's a lot going on. But something just hit me, and it really is powerful because of the experience most of you all went through yesterday. Uh, one of the things I remember about this bus ride is that it put me in the position of having to travel to town and back out every day. But I remember coming in on the bus one day from school, and there were people around the Georgia Capitol, which I passed every day coming back into town. And they, and they had picket signs, and there were, you know, people were out there, a lot of things going on, people talking and laughing at each other. And I was like, you know, okay, this is some kind of rally, right? And I'm used to rallies because my mom and dad are activists and um, artists. So, so you know, I, I see a big sign that says, you know, our dream came true. And I was like, okay, wow, that's, that's very powerful, you know, because, you know, this was around the time they were having this big debate about Dr. Martin Luther King as a national holiday. And so as we pull in past, and I'm, I'm right there against the bus window looking out, the man with that sign 
turns around, and on the front of it, I see that there's a picture of Dr. Martin Luther King with rifle crosshairs. And it says, our dream came true. So I quickly sank down into my seat so that they couldn't see me because I realized that I was in that place. And, I, and so that experience shaped me in, along with a lot of others. I finished seventh grade. My mother sent me to alternative school. My mother sent me to alternative school. It was a choice because this was not that place where people are disposed of. This was that place where special children get what they need instead of what other people think they ought to have. It was a unique school run by Dr. Rain Wilson. And Dr. Rain Wilson was an incredible educator. And I remember she called me to her office one day, and, and I was expecting the speech that you get if you're that kid who's like me. I'm just waiting for you to screw up so I can send you out of my house and get you out of my school or get you out of my neighborhood. And I'm always like, you know, I could probably get that done by lunchtime because I, I know how to do this. But I sat down in Dr. Rain Wilson's office, and she only had one chair that sat right across from her desk. And, you know, it was the chair. And, and you sat there. And Dr. Wayne Wilson was legally blind, so she had these very thick glasses that magnified her eyes. She could see very close, but, you know, but she was just kind of using them for affect. But, you know, so she had this thing where she would just, like, look straight ahead. And so I'm sitting in, her, in that chair, straight across from her, and she's just looking at me. And she's not blinking. <laughs> and it's making me nervous, right? And, you know, and she says, you know, I know who you are. And I was like, okay, here we go. Then I, I think you can accomplish Anything you set your mind to, and all you can do is prove me wrong. And sat there for a second. I said, she probably thinks that I'm somebody else. Not like she can see. You know, so I, I did the eyeball vision test. You know, I moved side to side a few times, and she just kept looking straight ahead. So I said, she don't know who this is. So, you know I'm Hassan, right? I said, she said I know who you are. And I think you can accomplish anything you set your mind to, Hassan. And all you can do, she said, is make me a fool for believing such a thing. And for the first time in my educational career, somebody told me that I was great and dared me to give up great for something less than that. And it changed my perspective of where I was going. In this school, I also had the opportunity to do mental math. And so one day a week, Dr. Rain Wilson would close all the books and she would start to rattle off numbers quick succession, and as soon as she stopped, she would expect the answer, and every single time she stopped, I would have the answer, and so one day a week, I was math God, <laughs> and for the next four days, I could sit there patient while everybody talked about stuff that didn't make sense to me, because I knew when Friday came, <laughs> I was going to be the man, and then she would walk down the hall with me, and she would talk to me about these esoteric things, and these off the wall things, and ask me questions, and we would get to the end of the hall, and she would say, Go and tell your teacher that you passed the test. And I say, what test? She said, well, the one you just took. Wow. So away from no way. Creating, demanding, refusing to allow failure to be your mouth. It's the work that we do. I eventually got expelled from Horizon School. I just got to put that out there full explosion. <laughs> but only after five years, and I've been there, I moved into the school, and I lived there with Dr. Ray Wilson and staff for four years, and this was my home. I got expelled. It was the hardest moment of my life. But I had to keep going, so I decided to get my GED, and with 1.67 GPA and a juvenile criminal arrest record, ADHD, dyslexia, visual hearing impairment, I was like, College has got to be looking for me somewhere, right? <laughs> and so uh, I applied to colleges that didn't quite get any responses, but I heard this one school in Kentucky, Berea College, and it became a lifeline for me. And that is probably a whole other story. I'm going to see what my next slide is because I have no idea where I was going. <laughs> you know, I want to talk about the performance I did last night. Living history became an incredible part of, of me uh, because it gave me a place. The ability to look back and understand that the struggles that we deal with are not unique, new struggles, creates the possibility by learning those lessons to move forward. And so many of our young people struggle and they fail because they don't realize that other people have struggled before them and have laid paths. And some of the work that we do is trying to show and to demonstrate that this is not new ground. It's just ground that we've got to keep going over. We've got to keep working until people understand that, that there's not a path. We've got to make a road. When I started doing Living History, it was a way to, to connect and to, to tell stories in powerful ways, to educate, but not just that, to connect with people beyond the intellect. And it's the same thing we have to do in the work that you do. These stories are important, 
because it doesn't allow people to intellectualize and to minimize through logic the people we serve, the challenges we face, and the important work we do. It's very easy if you're just talking about statistics to excuse and to understand the data. We talk about people. We talk about transformation. We talk about real change. We talk about changed lives. Then we have things that draw people in beyond the logic into the heart and to the power of the message. So I think it's important for us to continue to understand how powerful our stories are. And, and living history became a great thing for me. I want to tell you about my brothers. That picture in the middle, back, that's me on the end, the big, scary-looking guy. My, other, my brothers, Derek and Sean, were the, the cool, smooth guys. I mean, they were smooth. Sean on the end, he got the Don Johnson of the 80s. He, uh, he was smooth, and his, his, his street name was uh, Cass, Casanova Love, right? Because he was smooth like that, and then Derek was the same way in the middle. Both very smooth, incredibly competent men. We were wound up in this environment where we had to make choices a lot. I'm going to tell you about my brother because my brother Sean on the end, I remember coming home from the alternative school once to visit, and Sean was, was hanging out in the room, and he was chilling in the corner, had his watch tower on his head. I said, yo, Kaz, what are you doing? He said, yo, man, I'm talking to my girl. I was like, dude, you ain't talking to no girl. You got watch tower on your head. So I took him from him. Hello, I said. Hello. Somebody answered. Oh, snap, I said. Where'd you get this? He said, from that old Walkman. Y'all remember Walkman? Do you? Like, before we had iPods and before we had CD players, we had Walkman, right? You had a Walkman, a print tape, and 20 batteries. You could listen to like half the side, right? The chorus, 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 yes, right? He said, remember that walk? I was like, yeah. He said, I took that old walk, man, and I took it apart. And I started looking at it, and I took that door the telephone, and I took it apart, and I saw some things look the same, and I started messing with them, and I put the wire together, and I got some static. And I kept messing with it, so I got a dial tone, I put it back together, and I called my girl. <laughs> I said, you made this? He said, yeah, man. I said, no, so you made this? He said, yeah, I was just hanging out. Like, you? He said, yes, I made it. I went, well, get that. My baby brother sat in his room and built a telephone headset so he could turn the corner talking to his girl. <laughs> we didn't have telephone headsets back in the 80s, right? We still had that phone. <laughs> right? The six numbers in, you mess up, you got to call it operator for help. We didn't have all that cool stuff. But he built a telephone headset. I said, Sean, you could be one of those um, electric guys. <laughs> That's all I had, right? We have a squad now. You could be one of those electric guys. And he just started laughing. He said, no, man, this is what I do for hanging out at the house. Ain't nobody going to let me do this in the real world. Yeah, I believe that's what hopelessness sounds like. And you have children with all these incredible gifts, with all this beautiful talent, welling up inside of them, and they finally get to the point where they self-select that they will not have permission to be great. I think it's something we struggle with with our kids, the young people and families who serve every day. All of this other beauty and great power stifled because somebody told them they haven't got the right box checked to go on and do something important. What you need to know about my brother Sean is that when he's serving 57 years now, he's scheduled to release date of the year 2056. My brother Derek, same way, had this ability to engage people, to immediately create connections and relationships, to find something to tie you together. Even if you happen to be that guy that came into town from a whole other place, in five minutes you were his best friend and he knew it. But he didn't believe that people like us had a right to use that skill to take that gift to scale them because we all got kicked out of school together. Derek and I got our GED together. We all talked about changing the world, but talking about it's not doing it because somewhere inside that process, you remind yourself that you are not supposed to be great. And then you back up two steps and you wait for whatever coming next. What you need to know about my brother Derek, my best friend in the world, man who lungs I breathe my air into and whose heart I pump on the side of the road with my hands for five minutes once to keep them alive. 
is that he's 20 years into a life sentence. And I tell you this because this is what happens when those young people are pushed out of systems and not given the chance for their natural talents, for those other gifts outside of academia to lead and to live and live. And this is the thing that we have to fight against every day. These two are incredible men. And I've had the chance to meet CEOs and senators and presidents and all that, but I still hold them in the highest esteem because I know at the core what their potential was, just like you all know. With your children and the children and families you serve, we can see these incredible groundswell and people are constantly trying to cap, constantly trying to, to keep it under wraps because if, if that child can be great, then maybe there are folks who are wrong about all the other kids that they put in boxes. There's this quote that I use a lot. It says, the only child we cannot reach is the child we refuse to touch. And I started, I said it once at a conference, and, and it's just become a thing that I say. And now I say the only child of family we cannot reach is the family child we refuse to touch. But someone came to me once an educator says, well, that sounds good. But I really think that the truth is the only child we cannot reach is the child who refused to be touched. And I was like, wow, that's deep. She said, you know, because you know, I think you're an exception. You let people touch you. And at first I was like, you know, oh, that sounds good. I'm an exception. So wait, wait a minute. See, because when you create an exception, then you don't have to deal with the, the whole. So I backed up and said, no, no I, see, I, I see what you're doing, and that really was good. Right? God almost got me, right? But, but no, that's not it. It's not about what they are willing to take and what we are willing to get. This is a really important part as advocates and champions. It's not about, who is, well, there's this thing I used to do with kids with the, the person on top of the mountain did not fall there. I have this great image of people who are like halfway up mountains saying, you know, if you get here, I'll help you get to the top. And the kid's going, if I can get there, I don't need you to get to the top. <laughs> so it really is about us being willing to go to them and help them get to their dreams, right? Not wait for them to get to a certain level, or to cap out at a certain place, and then finally say, okay, now you're worthy. Now you deserve my attention. And it really is a challenge. Okay, um, I put this in here because usually by this time in any talk, I am way off base, and it gives me a moment to kind of refocus and to draw folks back. And so, everybody come back in. I can do a time check because I have no idea. Okay, 20 minutes, and that is about one third of the time I need and more time than I thought I had. So we're good. Um, so. So I'm not going to play a game because I kind of got myself back together and it's one thing I want to talk about. And more importantly, I want to share two things with you that, 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 that are, are, are kind of new things. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep going. I'm going to tell you a couple things that I, when I was thinking about this work, I was thinking about what are the strategies for really getting in and, and doing this work and staying powerful and, and staying engaged. And I think that, you know, avoiding sanity, act with faith and hope. Allow time, forgive failures, and deserve victory. This is kind of my, my list that I do when I'm working with educators, when I'm working with, with child servants. You know, this is kind of the list. If we could keep ourselves focused on these strategies, we might be able to move. And the truth is, I still got like 60 slides to go, so I'm not going to get through all of them, but I'm going to hit the highlights. Because there's some things that, that I heard earlier just starting out that I think were very connected. First thing is, you got to avoid insanity. You ever heard of insanity principle? Doing the same thing over and over again, but expecting by some miracle to get a different result, right? Or go, if you keep doing what you've been doing, you keep getting what you've been getting. Bottom line. Two plus two is what? Four. Say it like you mean it. People are like, oh, four. I'm not sure if this is a trick question, right? Two plus two is what? Four. Outstanding. If I put two plus two into a calculator, the people say, what do I get? Four. It's still four. People are like, I'm oh, being checked. Wait, did you say plus? Or? If I put two plus two into the calculator, and his equal sign, what do I get? It's still four, okay? But the two plus two to the calculator pay really hard for a different answer. Then his equals that what do I get? It's still four. But the two plus two to the calculator pay really hard for a different answer. And then do a ritualistic dance around the calculator like I really need it. Then his equals that what do I get? It doesn't change. It stays static. Praying for difference doesn't create difference. It's a great initiator. Intent. Hoping for difference doesn't create difference. Only thing that creates difference is a change in behavior, attitude, or patterns. The symbols have to change, 
The equation has to change. Something about the problem has to change to get a different outcome, or you continue to get the same thing. What we have done have been dressing up the problem for a long time, and we be looking at it different. Maybe if we stand over here with the lights on behind it, it won't. That's not how we change things. Action is required. And so in order for us to get a difference, we have to do things to take some risk, step outside the box. That's really important. It's hard for me in this work because I am risk, I am risk burdened, <laughs> okay? Uh, and, and the systems that we serve, especially formal systems, and I heard somebody saying it last night, right, talking about risk aversion. Who was that? Who was talking about risk aversion? Yeah. And so and that's, that's the thing that comes to mind. The, so all the systems we serve are risk adverse. They don't want to deal with risk. They, the, even if this is a terrible result, we know what result we're going to get. So let's just kind of keep it cool. But that's not how things change. But the insanity principle is a little deeper than that. If John Maxwell once said that it, in business models, it's a little different. If you keep doing what you've always done, your competition gets better and you get worse results. So it's not really a 50-something game. It's not really just tread water. You actually start to sink if you don't adapt. We actually start to erode in the results we get if we don't change. In our competition, all those things that we fight against, families being excluded, children being pushed to the side, children winding up in my formal system of care, juvenile justice, because nobody has taken the time to address their education, mental health, social health, or physical health needs. And so they want to isolate them and make them the problem and then send them off into a box so they don't have to deal with it. That is the thing that happens when we don't innovate. We don't get more creative, but we don't push this bar. And so it's very important to keep in front of our mind that we have to fight and push forward. We can't settle for tread water. Take some risks. Louis B. Mayer once said at the side of the film days, he came into a, into a shooting lot and everybody was standing around looking. He said, What are you doing? Well, we, we don't know what to do next, they said. He said, Do something. If it's good, we'll keep it. If it's bad, we'll do something else. But you got to do something. We have to be moving actively. We only learn from mistakes. And so we have to continue to push that muscle movement. Children rise or ultimately fall the greatest expectation the adult world holds for them. It's something I really believe. It's something that the coach talked about, right? You set that bar up just higher because even if they don't get to it, they will jump further than they would have if you kept it on the ground. And that's how we start to build capacity to build power. So the thing I want to talk about is faith and hope, which I thought you did a great job. I wish we we coordinated that. You know, faith and hope. I was like, man, he got the notes. <laughs> because this is absolutely the piece. Faith and hope is the cornerstone of the process. And I think the big piece of it is that these are action words, verbs. Actually don't exist unless you do them, right? You have to have faith in something, not just have faith. People say that I have faith that this child can learn, and they're not actually actively creating the possibility for a child to learn, or just pretending. Because faith is actually belief plus action, not just belief. And I think that's the thing that people lose out on. People believe stuff all the time, but belief in action is what creates faith. I had a friend who believed he was going to win the lottery. He kept telling me how he was going to get it because he'd been praying about it and it was just going to be his time and he's going to give me something from my own house and a program for kids. I was like, great. He's like, well, it didn't happen this week, but next week. Because I've been praying really hard and I've been, you know, it's going to work. And three weeks in, I said, Jojo, um, can we go buy you a ticket this week? At least, you know, start there. You know, you, know. you ever see that said, Must have a ticket to win. That's at least the start. It doesn't guarantee a win, but it's the only way to create the possibility. And with us, it's the same way. Our belief that these systems of care can support the families and children we serve is not enough. We have to actively engage in ensuring that these families and children are receiving the support and the access that they need and actually make it live. It's just the way it has to happen. And hope is a reliance on future possibility. I love hope. Hope is this incredible thing that, that makes, makes possibility, right? It's the ability to look forward and see if there's light there, like it says. If I keep kicking this water, eventually I'm going to get to it, right? That's that thing, future facing. I was working with families and kids once, and I was doing this thing with kids I do sometimes. I shared with the people I did a workshop on the bio form, and I was doing some great work. And one of the teachers I was working with, this is a difficult population, said, you know, this is great stuff, and they're talking so loudly about themselves. Do you think it's fair to set them up like this? I was like, what do you mean? So we know these kids aren't really going to be able to do all that great stuff they talk about. 
We're just giving them false hope. I was like, oh, man, that sucks. And so, I mean, I went home kind of depressed and upset at myself for kind of setting people up in the world to fail like that, with false hope. And, you know, for a minute I kind of drifted into some of my other issues that allow those things to pile up on me. And so, well, wait a minute. So I, I got the dictionary out and I started going through it and I looked up false. Not true, not able to be true. A lie. Okay, that's not a good start. So I looked up hope and I found this definition of reliance on future possibilities. So a lie about your future possibility, lying to people about what they could be. And I was like, wow, that is dangerous. No wonder so many people get burned out and so many of us are so afraid because we're given this false hope. And luckily, before I got to the conclusion that I need to walk away and become a monk somewhere, do something, my legal mind finally kicked back in. I was like, wait a minute. And I dissected and I looked at hope that says a reliance on future possibility. The thing I learned about a future lying statement is that it is a statement that cannot be realized in the moment. It is only something that is actualized at some later date. And so the truth of the matter is, the basic principle is, the philosophy is, that hope is a future lying statement. It cannot be proven false or true in the now. It can either be present or absent. And so as long as hope is present, it has potential to live. So it's actually impossible to have false hope. It is impossible to have false hope. The truth is we either have hope or we are absent of it. But if it is present, it is just waiting for the opportunity to reveal itself and create that possibility. And that's the thing we need to focus on, to understand and to know. Now we're going to 55 slides to go. And what I, what I understand now is that I can't get through all of them. And so instead of trying like I normally would, it would just really fast and make everybody's head hurt. I'm going to just take a deep breath and accept that we're not going to get there and tell you that it was good stuff, but we're still having fun. All right? Because there's some things that I do want to do. One thing I want to do is I want to share with you a piece that actually the first time I shared it was at the deep conference. I, um, I wrote a piece, and I, I'm, I'm a writer. I, 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 I write... Uh, Poetry used to be spoken word and get into that kind of thing, and, and, and it was my survival tool. It was the thing that I did. My mother sat me down when I was uh, very young, and she's a writer. My, both my parents were writers. And she said, just write. And I, so I took a pad of paper, and I took my, my, my pen, and I used to write, I still write like this. I, actually, I can't say I used to, you know. But I, and I just sat there scribing and grinding into this paper for about 20 minutes. When I was done, I'd torn through four or five sheets of paper, and most of you couldn't even read, but there was this, this release. I finally got all that stuff inside of me, that pain and that thing that was driving me out, so the rest of the world could see without me balling up and just swinging at the next person that looked at me and realized that because I was special, they didn't have to consider me. And so it became my tool for ordering the world, and I actually wrote this piece. My, my, my oldest son has some some unique needs, and he's, you know, he's uh, got some sensory challenges, and he's got a little bit of my ADHD and some other things, and, and it's interesting because it, it comes out very different to me, because when he was seven years old, he finished the whole Harry Potter series. When he was seven years old, he finished the entire series, and he could actually explain it to you in detail. When I saw the movie, I was like, that's just like Malcolm described it, right? It was incredible. But he's got these other things going on, and so... Um, I wrote this piece a couple years ago because I, I, I wanted to, to finally start to have the conversation about those kids who were being pushed out and, and, and pulled out of the system. I'm going to try and get through it, if, you know, I, I, it's in really big letters because deal with it, right, okay? So, uh, I mean, that's just the way it is, right? Y'all understand it. Y'all don't understand. Y'all need to get up out of here anyway, right? <laughs> It's called The Race, and I thought this was great, too, because we got the track coach through, right? race. So I'm like, no, we are right on the day, okay? It was a day like the rest, me sitting right there with the lost kids in another special class where I could fit the round pegs into square holes all day. As teachers excuse, we were just born this way. There's no need to be worried, no reason for stress. Your poor lives are not fair, so you just do your best. These last words they sing as they settle us down to pass blue and round scissors for our popsicle stick crowns. And while crafting a band for my popsicle crown, I reached hand into pocket and guess what I found? It was a note from my mother, again like last week, a reminder things don't have to stay as we see. Written big in block letters, more easily read. It still took me a while, but here's 
what that note said. I will always love you as the first day you were mine, but to change in their eyes, you must first change your mind. If you want new results, you can't act the same way as your need. Say, excuse me. If you want new results, you can accept what they say about your needs that make them think this box is okay. Put an eagle with cheeks does not mean he's to blame. But he must one day fly, son, or he fails just the same. So keep your minds on your dreams and your eyes on that door. The inevitable victory can still be yours. To raise you up high, any risk I would take, but you, my dear boy, you must plan this escape. Not sure what meaning the last line inferred, I returned to my crown with not much of a word. There I sat in the days of the work I'd been working, then noticed strange sounds like free birds that were chirping. The next minute there I spent disbelieving, no way could I see what my eyes were perceiving. A window just appeared, but there had been none before among these walls and locks, this peephole and door. From where this thing came, I didn't bother to guess, but bright light and cool breezes soon captured my breath. And right outside the window, I heard sounds unknown, people cheering and laughing and loud microphones. My teachers made one big mistake on that day. When someone opened the window, they long hid away. As they hurried and scurried and scrambled about, doing all that they could to block the scene out, trying their best to reseal the nice box we were in. I picked my note off the ground and grinned my big grin. I heard announcers announcing on loudspeakers speaking, welcoming the champions that came from last weekend. He said, today is today, and last week was back then. On a day like this, folks, anyone could still win. As I think back, I know they did not mean for me to take those words and excitement so personally. But there's no control over words that we say. Once out of the mouth, they translate their own way. Every ear that can hear must interpret for self. So I hustled and scurried right up on the shelf. And I slipped past the teachers and over the pane of the window before they could close it again. And I shimmied down columns just right for escaping and rushed myself over where people were pacing. I arrived at the field, was amazed by the scene of the runners and jumpers and all types of teams. They were stretching and reaching after preparing for months to take the first challenge and clear the high jump. Like animals, they leave. None knew fear or seemed hopeless, so I slid right in line, praying no one would notice. But someone did see through my thin veil of disguise. Maybe it was the boots or the scared look in my eyes. I think, I'll do my best, sir. This looks like a blast, not like making those crowns from old popsicle trash. As the judges hemmed and then hard, they explained the plain truth. Your training, your bills are not for this pursuit. They continued this line as the stars started starting, but from up in the bleachers, big voices started barking. Maybe he's lightning, just been bottled too long. You might think he's weak, but what if he is strong? Nobody has ever tried hard as he tried, and even if he falls down, he most likely won't die. From what I can guess were new friends of mine and my mother, who must have been there the whole time, came demands I be given one shot at the bar, despite having no chance to show talent thus far. So they made me some room and they let me back in, knowing there was no chance I could actually win. Then the time came when I was finally on at the line with the silence so deafeningly strong. In good humor they played, started lowering the bar for this unknown and untested, not right superstar. But I whistled and waved, now you put that right back. I can't break your record for the low jump like that. So rolling their eyes with fiendish sly grins, you know they quick raised my bar all the way up to 10. As they smiled and high fived, I heard one of them say, do you think that boy is bright enough to just go away? But they all seemed surprised. As in hiking boots clumping, I dashed for the mark they had set for my jumping. And with vision so clear I could hardly see through it, I leapt through the bar as if nothing was to it. There I floated, no, sailed, as the whole crowd stopped breathing, watching me attempt what they were not quite believing. Well, I didn't quite get over <laughs> More truthful to say, see, I, I barely made half of the distance that day. But no sooner flat on the mat, I was pumping my fist, reminding this crowd I was quite new to this. 
But what they could not have known from the smile on my face was that five feet had crushed my personal best to that day. It was two feet higher than the mark in third grade when they started to try to see how I behaved. It was four feet higher than middle school buzzing. They said, soon you'll be dead or in jail like your cousins. This mark was the highest that had ever been set. And after trying, I knew I was not quite done yet. So I stopped my odd dancing just in time to report there were people lining up for some other great sport. But before I could make it to the next crowded line, I was boxed and closed in by some old friends of mine. They were sent to track down the lost boy from room eight for a quiet return to his class. To his place. And once back there, they tried to downplay the whole scene, suggesting that life for me would be just a pipe dream. There are round pegs in your future. These square holes must be filled. It's good work for the hands and your particular skills. And I sat there a while, thinking maybe it's best that they saved me and brought me safe back to this death. So I looked and took note of all the names I could see of the kids that had rescued and returned before me. There was Carlos and Derek, John Tilson's name twice, Rashida, Raimundo, and my long lost friend Mike. So many more names here I did not recognize, including one signed A. Lincoln, here since 1825, in the top right hand corner. Between all of those lines, there was just enough space left to finally make this seat. Mind. But before eyes could dim back to that early blank state, I heard the words again echoed from the stands at that place where my mother stood shouting and waving banners sky high. So what if you fall down, boy? You most likely won't die. Then a strange courage to hold swept right over me. I grabbed a handful of crayons and some big butcher sheets then started to draft plans I had long feared to speak. I said marks for one hour, one day, and one week. And with those popsicle sticks, I started to build up a small room when complete was a full replica of this box where some said I would live my life out, where none would see my lost face and hear my mad shout. And I placed in this model where the brave lookers could see one red X on the wall where that window must still be. And then glancing around like I had not done before, I spied keys to the locks on the chain by the door. And since all teachers were busy passing glitter and paste, I just left them a note on that desk, gone to find my next place. Thank you. Now I know that time is of the essence, so I'm going to do this real quick. I'm going to share this with you because I think it's really important for you to see. Anybody know what that is? People are like, uh, it could be fabric, could be cloth. It's not that he, it's cloth, fabric, scarf, all that stuff, okay? Stained. I had one kid say, ugly! Right? And I was like, no, I just got to go with that. Just so a piece of cloth. I told you, you know, last night some of you saw me do York. When I was performing in York doing the Bicentennial Boots and Clark Expedition, I actually portrayed York for the nation as part of the commemoration. We spent a lot of time in Kansas and in, in Oklahoma. I mean, I, we, we hit the whole country. We went from, from Virginia all the way out to Oregon and back into St. Louis. And so over that six years, I spent a lot of time in Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, Idaho, or all those places. When it was that, I was in Idaho for a long time, maybe longer than anybody that lived there ought to be. Uh, but, but I had a good time there, but it was a long time, right? I wound up in Kamiya, Idaho, close to the Nez Perce Reservation for a long time. We had a lot of events going on. And since I don't sleep a lot and all the other stuff that I got issues with, you know, I, had, I drove an hour to Lewiston every night to go to the Walmart. Because that's the only Walmart in 70 miles. And so I go there because I knew it was over 24 hours a day and there was nothing open in Kamiya after 6 o'clock, so, except for that one bar on the corner. But, after, we didn't carry up in there a couple nights, but then I had to go, right? So anyway, if you get, so, so I went to Walmart. Like my third night at Walmart, I was walking around the Walmart, and I went to the fabric section. I hadn't been there yet. And so I walked through the fabric section. You know how you go through the fabric section. like, wow, you know, I hope people are making clothes out of that, right? Well, not everybody. But, and I don't do it all the time, but every once in a while, that's all you got left. So I was walking through there, and, um, and I found this table in the fabric section. It's a big old sign that said, discard table. There was like one piece of fabric, neatly folded in place on the table. 
This was like the single most unwanted piece of fabric in the state of Idaho, right? <laughs> and it just struck me all wrong. And so, so I, I picked it up and I took it to the, to the front, and, you know, and the guy was like, why is this black guy here buying green fabric at 3 o'clock in the morning, right? You know, and so I gave him my dollar, and, and ever since then, I've been taking, I've taken it with me all over the country, and I always invite people to, to help me, to give me ideas to figure out what we can do with this. I'm still trying to justify that dollar I spent, right? And, and one kid say, I'll give you two dollars just to throw it away because it's hurting me, right? And so, but I say, you know, we got to get more creative. So I was always asking people to help me figure out what I can do with this. Any ideas, suggestions? Cake. Superman. Superman. I love that that was the first thing, right? You know, and I love cakes. I, I love comic books. I've got 15,000 comics in my collection. My wife thinks that's the thing that makes that's the thing that makes me interesting, all right? You got you got issues, she says, and I was like, you knew that when you married me, lady. So I've got all these comic books because comic books is how I learned how to read. Because of my challenges, I couldn't I couldn't piece it together. My translator is broken like that. But what I started to do is I started to understand that I could I could understand storyboard. I could understand sequential imaging, and I could start to make leaps in my own intellect as what those things had to say, what the captions had to say in order for the picture to make sense, to be powerful. And so I actually became a proficient reader because this is the piece we got to get to, right? When we get outside the box and we say, we will make you, we will make you successful where you are, how you are. And so I, I love comic books and I love capes. You ever notice when people put capes on, their voices change. <laughs> they always say words like, Joe! Okay, cool. What else? A skirt. A skirt. This could be a good skirt. You know? I'm going to be real. All right. You know? Hey, right? Okay. A skirt. I got that. What else? Uh, okay, we hire a do rag and scarf. We'll do do rag first, right? Like, what you say, man? Right? I don't know if you'd be part of the Till Mafia or anything, right? Because that's probably not going to give you a lot of street cred, but, you know? And, or we can say, somebody said, uh, scarf? Is that what I heard? Scarf. You know, the thing with a scarf that makes a difference in a rag is, is the throw. Right? You don't have a throw, you just got a towel around your neck, right? You know? Or if you just put a piece of jewelry on it, you call it an ash dot, right? You're like a mascot. Like, like Fred from Scooby Doo, remember him? He's like, he always say, it's not a scarf, it's a mascot. And you're proud of that, right? Come on, I don't, I don't get it. it. It was not a good fashion statement. Anyway, what else? A what? A flag. The Teal Nation! Yeah, right? Alright, what else? Like a blanket or a picnic? Oh, picnic blanket? Yeah, yogi. Woo-hoo! Is a picnic blanket, eh? Right? Okay, very good. Since it's on the ground, we can also make it a what? Surfboard or flying carpet, right? What else? A beach towel. A beach towel, oh yeah, great for the beach. And then you get the towel after. Ooh, that was good. What else? Come on, what you got? Huh? A shawl? Be like somebody turning up the heat, baby. It's cold in here, right? Okay, what else? A blanket for a baby. A baby blanket. Swallowing cloth, right? You'd be like, Hey, good. What else? A swing. Yeah, I've worn more than a couple of these. Yep. I just fell again. <laughs> that was me. What else? Invis oh, visibility. Invisibility cape. <laughs> it always reminds me of Burks. You know, people are so. Right? Burks would be like, I'm out of here. I'm like, dude, you are still here. Right? But that's, that's a whole other psychosis, right? Okay, what else? Come on, help me. Huh? I swear, this would be an interesting swing. Maybe you could do a swing for kids. Oh, yeah. Give me a swing, right? Just can swing far. Or be a jump rope. What else? A tourniquet. A tourniquet, yeah. No, you have to stomp the flow. A loincloth. <laughs> you know, I don't know if I've ever got, I usually get like diaper or underwear, but loincloth is great, you know. Um, and people always say that like, you know, I got him now, he's not going to do it. I'm always like, you know what? I am not scared. <laughs> All right? I got this. Not a problem, right? Very good. You know, so this is uh, 
Just a plain old piece of cloth I bought at the Walmart store. It cost me a dollar. Had a young man ask me, Mr. Davis, why are you wasting your money on that? And I, I told him I, I wasn't sure, but I'd I think about it. The next time I, I came to visit with him, I said, you know, I think I, I figured it out. When I walked into that fabric section, I saw that big old table. Don't nobody want this table. Maybe, maybe it just seemed familiar. And I saw this piece of cloth on there that clearly other people said had nothing left of value. And so I bought it because I wanted to, I wanted to be wrong. And I've not been proven Otherwise, yet, because everywhere I've ever shown this and shared this, people have found the creativity and the imagination to make this valuable. I call this my anything cloth. And, and just like the work we do with these children and these families, it requires copious amounts of imagination and creativity to see and create the circumstances that make them useful, valuable, vibrant, great. This is our work. This is the important part of what we do. Finding value where other people only see loose, fragmented pieces of cloth. And weaving those pieces into something that everybody looks at and goes, wow, I wish I could have thought of that. That's the work we do. That's the work you do. It's been my incredible pleasure to, to get to know this work and to realize that I've been looking for y'all my whole life. It's like I finally hooked up with you and now y'all in trouble, right? Because I'm that relative that just shows up every once in a while randomly, hey, what y'all cooking, right? And, uh, and, and this has been incredible for me. And the work that I do, and I see a, an easy transition and translation from where I am in this system. And I'm trying to close these doors because I want to get back to acting. And I tell them, you know, I will be here doing this work because somebody needs to have eyes on the kids that have been put in the box. And my work is not to keep them in the box, but to figure out how I get it open without people realizing I'm the one that had the key. You know, but I'm getting it done. And I think the work you all are doing at this end of it is the work that allows these young people to transition into valuable lives without being pinned up in systems like this that completely eliminate and disregard the things that they could be bringing to the world. And it, there are lots, and it's great. And so the work that you do is, is valuable and the, and, and the partnerships are incredible. And, and I want to thank, thank you all again for the opportunity uh, just to be here, uh, just to, to, to fellowship. I mean, the networking and the opportunity to sit with folks and, and not have to explain everything, right? You know, I, I love it because I, got, I started explaining some things and be like, you know, I ain't even got to explain them there, right? This, this, this is great, right? And this is the way it ought to be. We all should find those communities that understand and value us as we walk into the room instead of trying to figure out and, and judge what our value is going to be because of how we walk into the room. And there is a difference. Johann Wolfgang von Goethe once said, if you treat a man as he is, he will remain as he is. But if you treat a man as he can and should be, he will become as he can and should be. I think in the work that we do, the families and children, if we look at them in their brightest light, with the greatest potential, with that faith and hope firmly in our hands, a, a willingness to walk into things unknowing with the belief that because we are there, something could change. Faith plus hope. And if we have the ability to hold those two as the, as the test of our work and the process that we do, then we will have the ability to make incredible transformations and to maintain that work over time with children, families, and systems. So I want to thank you and applaud you for the incredible work you do and, and appreciate you because y'all are just like Dr. Lorraine Wilson and me. That person who refuses to accept what's presented, but instead chooses to dig deep enough to see what is present. And there's a difference. So thank you so much for the opportunity to share with you, for the incredible work you do, and I'm excited at what we do next. Look out, everybody, right? Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.